We move forward about 50 years to the 1950s and 60s. You might not recognize Eric Erickson from this photograph. <laughs> it's a metaphor. You may have picked that up without me saying it was a metaphor. But, you know. um, does anyone recognize this? I think some of you do because I've used it before in GW. <laughs> but this I'll give you, I'll save you the Q&A. This, uh, for anyone who is familiar with the British Isles, knows that uh, there's something which is called British summertime, which is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, but there are these coastal cities where, which are called the seaside. <coughs> and because it rains a lot in the summer in Britain, but people have still gone there to the seaside on their vacation, they have to find things for the children to do that will make them smile instead of cry. One of the things they have found is that each of these towns have their own candy. This is hard candy. It's in the form of a stick. And each town has its own rock. It's called Blackpool Rock. You may know the novel by Graham Greene, Brighton Rock, which is a play on words about the rocks in Brighton and this kind of candy. And the reason it's called rock is because it's incredibly hard and can last about a week of vacation if your teeth give out first. I don't know which gives out first usually. But um, one of the things about this candy is that it has, they, they, I think they figured this out in the 19th century, there was a way of printing within the candy the name of the town that went all the way through. So it didn't matter how far you went through the candy or where you chopped it, it would still have within it Blackpool Rock. It's a production technique that they figured out probably uh, 150 years ago. And uh, why is this Eric Erickson? Well, Eric Erickson is not as quotable as William James, but he has a concept which is very, very powerful. His idea of how identities develop, evolve, is through crystallization. They start out fluid with a variety of ingredients, a person's ego, his upbringing, his genetic inheritance, and the social demands on him in the various communities in which he participates. And as he grows older, these fluid elements Began to begin to stabilize into a certain kind of configuration. And that mature adult is one whose identity has crystallized. And just as the same way as this mix of food coloring and sugar and water, that's about it really, uh, that goes into this candy, starts off fluid and formless. It eventually takes shape through various kinds of process which involve heat and uh, react chemical reactions. It turns into something that has stability, so much so that it doesn't matter where you chop it, it will still have that same DNA that's written all the way through. And that was Erickson's account of identity. The person, as he becomes a true self, is one that it doesn't matter in what context you put them, there will be recognizable elements of that person that are true and valid throughout each of those different places. So through time and across space, you will identify these elements which mark out that person as having the same identity. That's Eric Erickson. Of course, it's more, it's more complicated than that. Eric Erickson didn't think this happened once and for all. He thought one of the big reactions was an adolescence. But he also was very aware of the fact that over the course of a lifetime, these, stability, these, these plateaus of stability could be disturbed by moving into new places, having new things happen, taking on new roles and there would be a new period of fluidity. But eventually, each time, another plateau would be reached, and a new stability would be reached. A person's identity would crystallize in a major way during, at the end of adolescence, if someone became an adult, but it would continue to become fluid and stabilize again over the life course. So, Eric Erickson. We move forward another 20 years or so to a psychologist that some of you may have heard of, some of you may not. Um, of the psychologist Kenneth Gergen, who is still, I think, writing and researching, and he's in his 80s now in Swarthmore College, but he's spent most of his academic career at Swarthmore. Some of his ideas may have been anticipated, some of you may be familiar with this kind of idea from sociologists like uh, Irving Goffman. But Kenneth Gergen published in 1972 a popular article in Psychology Today, the title of which says everything. The article was called Multiple Identities, the healthy, happy human wears many masks. 
And he basically took Ericsson to task twice over. He first of all said, Ericsson, you say that we all crystallize and become stable and integrated. Not so. We don't. The second point was, not only don't we, we shouldn't. Your version of maturity and adult health is not one that I subscribe to. A healthy, happy human is one who is able to move into different contexts and different social situations and adapt. An identity is fully formed when it is a broad repertoire of performances and masks that someone can take on and put off, depending on the situation and the demand. So here we have three very different accounts of identity, and we could add on to them many from before William James, way back to the Greek philosophers and even before them, and beyond versions of narrative identity, identity is negotiation. There are many metaphors we could use. But these are three very influential theories of how identities form that have, I think, determined much of how we educate over the course of at least 100 years. Now, they're different. They have different emphases. But I would like to argue that they have something in common. Each one of them relies on three fundamental tensions, three dimensions of identity, each one putting the balance between these dimensions in a slightly different place. But the three dimensions are there in every theory of identity. And to explain to you what I mean by a dimension, I'm going to um, I'm going to refer to F. Scott Fitzgerald's famous article from, the, from Esquire in 1936. It was called The Cracker. And this is, often gets quoted. And unlike most things of F. Scott Fitzgerald that get quoted, this one actually is true. He did, he did write this. <laughs> the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to now, what I mean by a dimension is being able to be caught between two extremes, two poles on a continuum, and still function. Each dimension is effectively a tension between two extremes. So I'll take you through them, one by one. This is my ID in 3D. The first dimension is continuity. The next is authenticity. And the final one is individuality. Now let's look at what I mean by this. Continuity is that dimension where a person is pulled between who they were then, then can either be in the past or in the future, and who they are now. What makes me the same person that I was yesterday or that I was 10 years ago, even though so much of me has changed? If we take, for example, biology, every single one of us has is now the bearer of cells that didn't exist on their date of birth. We have completely rejuvenated our cellular organism so that we're completely made up of something, we're made up of different material. What is it that makes us the same person? And the same way that that's true biologically, it's also a fundamental question at the heart of what, it, what identity is. What is it that keeps us the same person? And so everybody is living in a tension between who they were then or who they're going to be then and who they are now one of the dimensions. And each one of these theories deals with that. Uh, the second dimension is what I would call authenticity. Each one of us lives in a tension between how we feel and experience on the inside and how we are seen and categorized on the outside. And we live in the distance, in the, in the gap between those two. And these are two pulls on our sense of self. And finally, individuality. Each one of us on the one hand, considers themselves unique, special, uh, once-in-a-lifetime experience. But at the same time, we belong to groups with part of larger collectives. And that is another dimension, the tension, between, uh, the tension of which defines who we are and what our sense of self is. And, each, and my argument is, is that each of these theories of identity, whether it's William James, or whether it's Eric Erickson, or whether it's Kenneth Gerson, each one of them is attempting to give an account of where the ideal, appropriate balance lies between these dimensions, or on these dimensions. And each of them gives a slightly different account. So for example, just to, I'm not going to go into detail, but just to give an example, Kenneth Gergen would say that on the um, authenticity scale, 
You're saying that his, he puts the point of balance way in the direction of the we. Of the, sorry, outside. The outside determines an enormous part of who we are. Whereas William James, on the other hand, says no, the appropriate point of balance is way in the direction of the inside, of our choices and our sense of whether we've made the right one. So they have different points where they think the adult, mature, healthy person ought to be on these dimensions, but each of them is using them in order to understand what an identity is. Here endeth the theoretical lesson. Now we move on, put identity to the side. We're not going to talk about identity for at least 10 minutes, and we're going to dive into cyberspace. Now, to define the digital age is extremely complicated, and therefore I have simplified my job by saying I'm going to choose a very particular part of the internet age, which I think epitomizes much of what we're interested in. And I'm going to narrow down my focus to applications. And within applications, ones that you can find on your smartphone, and that are in the area of social media. And in the area of social media, I'm going to choose Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Now, WhatsApp may require some explanation because it's a little like soccer. It's very popular around the world, and no one knows what it is in the United States. <laughs> so when I say WhatsApp, just think iMessage. OK? The reason there is no WhatsApp in America is because of the saturation of the smartphone market by Apple. It's at around 84%. And therefore, no one needs to know what WhatsApp is, because everything that WhatsApp does, iMessage does too. So when I'm talking WhatsApp, just think iMessage. 